Come on, b- Come on b- bitch, let's bitch, go. Let's go. Guys, well, there's going to be two beginnings of today's show. I know that's weird, but I had to do it this way because so much happened in the last 24 hours and I was traveling back from the United Kingdom to my home and I have so much insight on some of the stuff occurring that I was dying to just tell you guys everything. And I was like, oh, forget it. By the time I get home, do the thumbnails and everything else with all my other content, it'll be too late. The wave will be over. So I decided to do a beginning to today's show, which by the way, is a really awesome gossip sesh with Reality Diamond Freddy. So what we're going to do is in the first part of today's podcast, I'm going to talk to you about what happened with Jen Shaw and Tanisha and Monica Garcia from Bravo's Real Housewives of Salt Lake City, just because I have something that not too many people have seen in my possession. As you guys know, I received the cease and desist that Jen Shaw sent to Monica Garcia before she actually got indicted. And that cease and desist actually called out that Jen Shaw knew that it was Monica Garcia, or whatever her name is at this point, uh, who had stolen all the video footage and taken video footage of Jen Shaw screaming and all this stuff from her house and had dropped it on the Reality Von T's Instagram account, which Monica was controlling with some other people, which were all in the cease and desist that I was sent. So this is pretty groundbreaking stuff because, you know, if you guys thought that Jen Shaw didn't know that Reality Von T's was in fact Monica Garcia doing all of that, it's it's not accurate. Actually, Jen did know before she got arrested. And then Jen gets arrested like 20 days after she sends a cease and desist to Monica, Garcia, and Cohen, others. I'll read you a little of it in a minute. But essentially, this was Monica's plan. It was sort of to, I think, take Jen Shaw out for her evil deeds. Jen had betrayed Monica a few times in different ways. And Monica just got sick of the shit like most people. And she decided that she was going to drop all the receipts on Jen Shaw. So she took all this video footage and everything that she got in different ways. And she spilled the tea on this Reality Von T's site. And I think she had another one too that was similar in name. And then it got shut down. And so she jumped accounts. Now, I talked to her a ton at this time, not realizing it was the Monica that we came to know now on the show, season four of Real Housewives of Salt Lake City. (laughs) Okay. And her and I had many a conversation about Jen Shaw. She wanted to know where some of my theories came from around uh, the fact that Jen Shaw was involved with Trump University. Uh, For those of you who don't know, back in, you know, when Jen first got on the show, I was one of the first people who started doing deep dives on all the Salt Lake City people. And one of the things that I found out was that Jen Shaw had been in multi-level marketing industries for people who had gotten in entanglements with the FTC for years. And so her mentors had all been in the multi-level marketing circuit and questionable at best. And in fact, she had been the director of business development at uh, a place that was selling a license of Trump University. So meaning it wasn't related to Trump, it was just his name licensed by this company to try to sell these real estate packages for lots of money and then people couldn't get their money back and same kind of thing that Jen Shah got indicted for later. So I think this is how Reality Von Tees, aka Monica, found out about me. And then she would send me her post to repost about Jen screaming, et cetera, in which case in some I did, right? And I didn't know it was her. She never told me she was casting for the show or any of that. So that was sort of uh, what happened with Reality Von Tees. I want to say Tanisha, who recently went on 
social media, was Monica's best friend. And I guess she also was involved in this account with Koa. And so she released all these receipts and videos and stuff online in fragments. Different influencers reposted them. It got a little confusing. Let me go ahead and play you some of them so you can hear them for yourselves. I'll do my best to do this in order. And uh, then I will read you some of the cease and desist. And I think you're going to get a lot out of that that you didn't know before. So hold on a second. Here we go. Monica, she hated Jen. And now she is Jen 2.0. She is a liar, a deceiver. Wow. Comfortably sitting there lying comfortably sitting there lying so it's okay i've got a receipt to back up everything that i've ever I've dealt with for this woman her. ever can't wait okay um i was fully aware of that page a screenshot that was shown like we're in holiday give us heather's address her and koa would literally go and sit in people's people's jen's freaking neighborhood for hours we would always be like girl what's the freaking point like go home and she would always try to figure out all the ladies addresses so i know what you're capable of and now you're doing it to me in real time. This is what make I'm in make disguise. Me a matchmaker, make me a match. Driving by Jen's house. Low key, I think I might find I might have found my father's actual descent. So obviously the first part of that was Tanisha spilling the tea, showing images and text messages of Heather's house like Monica was stalking her. And then that was Monica sending her a video that she thought was really funny where she has like a scarf over her head and she looks almost Middle Eastern. And then she makes the comment that the scarf over her head looked so good that she might have found her father's nationality. In other words, I, I mean, God, we love ourselves, don't we? Okay, so then another thing that comes out is Heather Gay blames Jen Shaw for giving her the black eye in season three where she's really drunk and she's last the cameras catch her. She's running around with Jen Shaw and then the next morning she's got this black eye and she won't tell anybody what happened. Well, I heard what happened and I heard from pretty damn good source what happened and unfortunately I have to report that Jen Shaw did not give Heather that black guy. So I can only assume that the producers made her say this for season four. More on that in a minute. Let me tell you what Jen Shaw sent out into Instagram land from prison when Heather made this announcement that it was Jen who gave her the black eye. Bravo, if I punched Heather in her eye, you guys would have footage to prove it. It's clear the show can't live without me since I was brought up at the beginning, middle, and end of the season four. Andy is still but hurt that I turned down his one-on-one -on -one interview. Why would you sit down with someone who, quote, gave another cast member a black eye? Next story. Well, unfortunately, you guys, I have to say that I think Heather Gay is lying on purpose. I think she wasn't lying and then she decided to lie. Do I think Heather Gay would lie intentionally to all of you guys? No, I think the producers put her up to it and maybe said, listen, just say Jen Shaw did it, right? And leave it there. Now, would this be like the network? No, I think it's like her private producer who she's working with. And you may be wondering why Heather would participate. Well, the way I heard she hit her eye was pretty boring. Didn't make for good TV, that's for sure. <laughs> this would be, it's way better. Jen Shaw did it. Yeah. And by the way, Tanisha is Heather's hairdresser, which is how kind of Heather and Monica get intertwined in all this. Now, Monica took to her live and called out Heather and said, you didn't pay a person who put fake lashes on you when you asked $100. You haven't paid me back for Bermuda, all this stuff. So she was like whacking back at Heather, but there's no comparison. You know, Monica, what she did was next level shit. And there's no doubt in my mind that Monica thinks like Jen Shaw at this point. So I just want to say that to you, but I'm trying to give you all sides here. Now, another thing that happened is Tanisha is dropping receipts that were sent to her 
by Monica over the last three years when they were friends. And in these receipts, um, some of them are very personal. And she's saying, I'm going to drop them all. So Monica's like, brace for impact because I know that my best friend's going to like try to destroy my life now. So this has gotten really ugly between Monica and Tanisha. I'm not sure what set Tanisha off so much, but something did. Maybe Heather Gay said, listen, you know, you owe this to me to to fix this situation and this is her doing it. Now I'm I'm building up to the cease and desist because you're going to get a lot out of that because this was before any of this came out and it has the truth in it. So hold on a second while I play you the video that Tanisha dropped of Monica and her mom screaming at each other.
Well, if you wondered if being on a reality TV show was toxic and what happens behind the scenes that a lot of ex-housewives talk about the mind fuck, well, there you have it. There's a great example (laughs) of what we're talking about. Listen to that. Boy, the lines between your real life and the reality show and the drama and the manipulation kind of blur and can make you a little bit crazy. And there is proof. Now, let me play you one more thing. Did Heather pay you back for my... Oh, wait! That's so true! This person said, did Heather pay you back for the money you owe on... Like, no, Heather, Heather, if you're watching watching this, or if actually Andy too has something to say to you, Heather Gay, you have me blocked actually, but if you are watching this or having one of your friends watch this for me, you have not paid me back for Bermuda. Add it to the $2,000. Just deduct it from the $2,000 I owe you. Also, you owe Andy $100 when he did your glam in Palm Springs. Yeah. And you never paid you for that. You asked Monica for me, and I went to your room, put your lashes on, you said, give me $100. So, Bitch, where is it? Uh, where is it? You owe My me money, you owe him money. Said. How are you going to sue people when you out here owing them money? <laughs> anyway. No, she did not. You know, Angie did. Totally. Shout out, Angie. Cool. Angie paid me back right away. Anyway, she's all over the shop right? She hates Angie. Angie paid her back. Well, now we know why nobody wants to shoot with Monica because she's kind of lost her shit and she's all over the place. And I think she's not sure at this point whether all of this stuff coming out and the meltdowns, uh, you know, that she's doing on Instagram and all that stuff are hurting her or helping her. Who knows what Lori, the producer, is telling her. So she could be just getting more and more egged on by all of this. But, uh, I mean, I you guys may have wondered why I kind of stopped covering Salt Lake City, and that's because I started to realize that it was all bullshit. Like, everybody was lying. There was no truth being told on the show. It was becoming a completely fabricated soap opera. And I have no interest in that. That's not what I'm watching for. I like to see reality. So I'm looking for, sure, a soap opera, but I wanted to come from real events that maybe someone exaggerates. Uh, You know, even worse to me is a bunch of women lying for the sake of television and not showing their real lives at all and making up complete drama that isn't true. I've already called out that Whitney did not have any trouble with her marriage with Justin Rose. How could I sit there and watch the show where she's depicting it the whole time? And it's bullshit. So, I mean, I could go on and on, but I won't. I'll leave it there. Let me read you the cease and desist, and then we'll wrap this segment up. And I'm going to move on to Tom Girardi's order, which was released the other day about his competency. And he was deemed competent for trial. So they're going to throw the mother effing book at him. And I'm so excited. Grab your popcorn. Okay. And like I said on my shows recently, there are more indictments coming and the IRS is still investigating Erica Girardi and Tom Girardi at this time. Both, you know, on a state and federal level, there's tax liens and they're definitely being investigated. So there's that. Now, I want to say on just to get you guys excited, the second part of the show is Freddie and I talking about Real Housewives of Beverly Hills and some really juicy royal gossip that he filled me in on that was like a missing piece I didn't know. And it blew my mind. And for my friends out there that like to cover the royal gossip and also are in the dig gossip related to the socialite circuit, they're going to love Freddie and my show in the second part of this episode. So let me go ahead and read you the cease and desist now. First and foremost, I want to point out that Tanisha is not listed on the cease and desist. So Jen Shaw did not know that she was posting to this account if she was. Who knows, though? At this point, there could be a con happening with Tanisha and Monica where they're just trying to create all this drama to make sure Monica gets on the show next season. I don't know. Now, do I think that would work? No, not necessarily, but it might. And I've seen other housewives do it, have uh, fights and feuds off the show to try to generate attention and popularity around them to guarantee their contract next season. Just saying, Tanisha could still be being a best friend by doing all these things to get uh, Monica's name out there. You know, make her the most famous 
so she gets another stint on the show because this is do or die for Monica. She's kind of like Brandy Glanville season two vibes, like nothing to lose, everything to gain, no matter what comes out about her on the show. Okay, so cease and desist was sent by Par Brown, G, and Loveless. It was sent on March 5th, 2021. And yes, they didn't get paid. I know that you guys are about to say that in the comments. Okay, it was written to Mr. Koa. Johnson, Miss Monica Fowler, and Miss Savannah Gonzalez. And Koa, as you guys know, was in a whole scandal with Jen Shaw about him saying that she was abusive and screamed at him and, you know, berated him with awful and degrading things. And she said Koa left her high and dry and took money from her and, you know, totaled her car and did all these other bad things to her financially. And so he was, he deserved the screaming because of his behavior. He said she never paid him for work he did. She said the work was shit, this kind of thing. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, okay? But that's the gist of it. All right, so um, here is the cease and desist demand. I wonder if Coach Shaw drafted this. It says, Dear Mr. Johnson, Ms. Gonzalez, and Ms. Fowler, this firm represents Sharif and Jennifer Shaw with respect to the matters that follow. I've been informed that within the past several days, each of you have been involved in posting and likely acted in concert with each other to post certain content about the Shahs online, including on Instagram. This includes, but is not limited to, content posted on the Instagram account, Reality Von Tees 2, and also may include the Instagram account Shaw Shepherd, both of which are public accounts. Oh, I think Shaw Shepherd was Angie Harrington's husband's account, so <laughs> they were off on that one. All right. The content that you have posted includes surreptitiously recorded and illegally obtained video and audio recordings of Mr. and Ms. Shaw. I'm advised that this video and audio was unlawfully acquired from the Shaw's home security system to which none of you had authorized access for the purpose of obtaining, downloading, or further disseminating my audio or video recordings. I'm also advised that additional posts on the previously identified accounts, including comments from one or more of you, contain further false and defamatory comments regarding Ms. Shaw. You are hereby on notice that the content you've posted and conspired to post regarding the Shahs has been illegally obtained, including the unlawfully acquired video and audio recordings and that your dissemination of that content on Instagram and otherwise subjects you to liability under multiple federal and state laws. This liability includes violations of the federal and state wiretap acts, and there's all these liabilities that they have from this. Uh, though I am informed that it is likely that one or more of you is directly responsible for the illegal acquisition of the unlawfully obtained audio and video recordings of Mr. and Ms. Shaw, these statutes impose liability even if you are only responsible for disseminating such content, which includes posting or conspiring with others to post that content on Instagram. Furthermore, the conduct described above subjects each of you to further liability for multiple common law torts under Utah law. These include torts for invasion of the Shah's privacy, including intrusion upon seclusion and publication of private facts, defamation, false light, torturous interference with economic relations, and intentional infliction of emotional distress. The Shahs hereby demand that you immediately remove all content from Reality Von Tees 2. Instagram account that relates in any way to Mr. or Ms. Shaw. To the extent any of you has any connection to or has any role in contributing content to Shaw's Shepherd, Instagram account, the Shaw's further demand that you immediately remove that content as well. The Shaw's further demand that you remove any other content you've posted or disseminated on any medium, internet or otherwise, including any other social media account regarding the unlawfully obtained recordings of the Shaw's and any other false defamatory statements regarding the Shaw's. Eh, blah, blah, blah. It goes on and on same kind of stuff. Okay. But nothing happens because Jen gets arrested. Now, just a reminder of what one of these videos that was posted on Reality Von Tees was. How many fucking hands do you need? You got four fucking, like, honestly, Koa, this is insane. I, I need more, like, I just need more. 20 more people? You need 20 more people? Like, how many more people do you need to do one fucking thing? One thing? It's a lot of work and a short amount of time. 
like that. And I'm the only one with the information. Then fuck it. I'm not wearing JSA. Send everybody home. I'm not wearing JSA. I'll call and make something else. You guys can all go home. Everybody go home. Actually, I'll tell them to go home. to tell the difference really between Monica and Jen Shaw in that audio. She's yelling at Koa and someone is next to him recording it uh, so that he can use it. And obviously the plan was to record Jen Shaw when she would lose her shit like and that no one knew and then, you know, disseminate it, I guess, on Reality Von T's too. Uh, see, now here I was talking to Reality Von T's too for months and months and months, and it didn't even occur to me to ask her why she started the account. And maybe that's what I should have done. But as Monica says, karma is a bitch. Okay, now on to the Tom Girardi order. You guys will be happy to know that he is competent to sit in his jury trial and participate. That's hot. That's hot. That's hot. That's hot. That's hot. The order is really interesting because you start off and you hear all the different people around Tom Jordy, co-workers and doctors and specialists that were brought in and, and family members Etc. And they're all kind of tugging in different directions. Yes, there's been some mental decline, potentially from age, potentially from dementia, potentially from the car accident from 2017 that we heard Erica tell a few different renditions of. But needless to say, the bottom line is that the reason he's competent to attend his trial is based on a few merits the judge ends the order with, which I'm going to share with you now. First of all, the judge believes that the defendant is able to understand the nature and consequences of the proceedings against him. And why the judge feels that way is that Tom Girardi seemed to clearly understand the nature of the charges against him, including the theft component. And when he spoke about the charges brought against him, he had a better knowledge of the law than most regular people do, I guess, even with whatever is plaguing his mental capacity at the time. The judge says that the defendant disclaims knowledge of the existence of the charges and or the ability to remember he has been charged, but he claims knowledge that he did not engage in any wrongdoing, including the knowledge that he did not steal any settlement funds intended for Girardi Key's clients. In doing so, he allows for the possibility that certain funds were not properly distributed by Girardi Keys due to negligence. And on this point, he does not shy away from the responsibility for any such negligence. As discussed at length herein, the defendant purported denial of knowledge of the charges made against him and or the purported failure to remember such charges once reminded of them is wholly lacking in credibility. The defendant's overall understanding of the current proceedings including their nature and consequences, was demonstrated when the charges against him were framed in the hypothetical by doctors Woods, indeed most likely drawing on decades of experience as a civil trial attorney. The defendant demonstrated an extensive understanding that far exceeds that of an average criminal defendant. He showed a knowledge of the substance of the charges, the factual allegations underlying those charges, and how those charges might relate to the operations of Girardi Keys, how to defend against those charges, how a trial proceeds, the role of the others involved in the trial, i.e. the prosecutor, defense, counsel, judge, jury, and the likely consequences if, if he was found guilty. So clearly the judge sees that he 
not only understands the hot water he's in and the procedure, but he actually, in whatever his communication is that he's having with people, is clearly trying to aid them in the defense with his knowledge of the law, which would far exceed a regular person in the same situation. So even if he has some sort of mental decline, he knows 10 times more than the average person in the current situation. And sort of this leads into number two, which the judge really relied on, which was the defendant is able to assist properly in his defense. And he even made suggestions to compensate for his short-term memory loss to his legal team. So this, so this impacted the judge that Tom Girardi himself was trying to solve problems with some of his mental decline in so he could defend himself, which was an indicator that he can definitely help his defense if he's making those kind of suggestions. Now, this is really telling in uh, part two of the judge's statement. The judge says, here it is much the same. At the zenith, defendant's superior cognition and his abilities as a civil trial attorney would have been likely to result in an exceptional ability to participate in his own defense. But any actual diminishment of these abilities or his cognition is not as severe as defendant presents it and stripped of the feigning and or exaggeration described by the experts and found by the court herein, defendant retains the ability to, quote, assist properly in his defense. Thus, as discussed extensively herein, the defendant meets both parts of the legal standard for for competency to stand trial. So that's it. Tom Girardi is competent. So unfortunately, that was a really bad result for him, and he will be facing two jury trials regarding two indictments. One is a Ponzi scheme type indictment, and the other is stealing uh, money from the Lion Air victims specifically. And I would say Tom Girardi's last hope was this attempt. And now that this one's gone, he's going to really struggle. I'd say the defense is going to try to work on some sort of technicality later, an additional technicality, but not looking good for Tom Girardi for sure. All right, let's get on to the Freddy and my show, the real one. All right, let's do it. Come on, bitch, 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 let's go. Hi, you guys. Oh, you can't believe it. I came back to London to meet up with Reality Diamond, Freddie. We we found this like boutique hotel uh, near Paddington Station called The Pilgrim. And we found like a lounge area where we could hang out and talk, you know, gossip about housewives and other fun things. Now, I don't normally do shows about housewives or reality TV, but today I am going to do it because... We haven't done it in a while, and Freddie's so fun to do it with. But I will say this. I, you know, you guys probably know in the Patreon, I've been covering the Middletons. I've been covering a lot of royal gossip lately, because I'm here, so why not? And, um... And I wanted to let you know that Freddie found out some information about Pippa's husband, James Matthews, that I didn't know. And that ties back to Freddie when he was working in reality TV a little bit. And so he filled me in on all the stuff I didn't know. So I'm going to have him tell us that today too. Okay. So uh, let me just bring Freddie in now. Let, Let me play some sort of UK music to bring Freddie in. Hi everyone, it's good to be back and it's finally good to see Dana face to face and do this face to face. We've done so many of them, but we've been on the other side of the world, but now sitting next to each other doing this, it's a, com- it's a game changer. It's a completely <laughs> different story. So I think we're going to have a lot to talk about now with face to face. And yes, we did see each other at Adam's um, meet up, which by the way was amazing. We so all fun. had a really fantastic time. Yeah. But obviously, you know, it was Adam's event and he had a lot of other people. So whilst, yes, Dana and I did speak, we didn't have loads of opportunities to speak. We met uh, Jack Lubby from Below Deck as well. He came, he was really nice, good to meet him. I and think he liked me. Yes, he did. He was like trying to make out with me, I Was think. he? Yeah, but he Ooh. was also hammered, to be fair. Well, to be <laughs> honest, you know, those Below Deck people are quite naughty. So 
Is it that surprising? Not no, really. I'm gonna. We'll definitely be reaching out to him. <laughs> yes, he definitely. I needs could to date come him. He's about my height. Yeah. <laughs> Oh. But I don't know whether he'd put you in the lifestyle that you deserve. That we'll I don't think to, so. We'll have to see. I think it would be a one night stand, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, But yeah, to me, Adam and Jason was great. And I think what was interesting is, you know, to because obviously we've worked with loads of people and then people think, oh, if someone doesn't work with someone, they don't like someone and all of that. So it was really, you know, we do get along. And whilst we all have our differences as YouTubers, that's not to say anyone hates each other. We all do different yeah. content and there's room for everyone. I Absolutely. think that was um, very clear. And we, we were able to really realize that that was what it was all it all was and that it was just commenters that were you know making a fuss about different things that just weren't really true well i think that the youtubers that have good energy find each other and the ones that don't don't or they fall off and that's it you like like energy finds each other that's what i think yes definitely i think we we all have great energy we all have our stuff that we're doing we all come together at the end of the day to to do different things we all speak to each other and i mean with adam and jason you know it was interesting did you have to... an, a fight with them or something no i never had a fight yeah, with them no. but i think people just thought was we didn't like each other because of cheryl's yes yeah, i might have been to do with that but i think <laughs> with the with the jen shah interview i think i said like oh i wouldn't interview her or something right. like that because yeah. We all know, based on the evidence, that she's a crook. The only thing I'm guilty of is being shamazing. Yeah. And I think a lot of people thought that was me taking a jab at Adam and Jason. I see. And it wasn't. It was interesting to get the perspective, even though Jen Shah was lying. Yeah. Um, and like even, but and I said to them when they they did the interview with Katerina Lenny's new girl, mm. that you know it was a massive risk and it definitely paid off because we were only hearing her from page six, weren't we? So to get a real perspective where she couldn't run away, I thought what was good. So yeah. you know. So right now I am raising in a huge social media campaign awareness, funds, and signatures to help animals and labs, more specifically mice, and I'm just. Like in the morning when I wake up and I think about making a difference in this field, like I, I get excited and it like ignites something inside of me. Um, and Lenny's being very supportive of, of this, and he even he even agreed to let me do my own like it's gonna be like an art installation at Halloween that I'm very excited about to raise awareness and connect signatures to help mice who are currently trapped in depths to break free. Mm. And I think it was also really interesting to hear that, you know, YouTube's not their only thing. They're doing all these businesses yeah. and things like that. Like uh, Jason was talking about the business he was doing with Caroline Stanbury, which is yeah. really, really interesting. What was he doing? Um, so, you know, that the manifesting business that they've got, he's a he's a part of that. So it's the manifest business. Um, so they've made this. Um, it was called Bust the Label. <laughs> is what it's called so they're doing that together so that was really interesting to hear what is bust the label bust the label is caroline's um but what does it do? and so it's these books about manifesting and you can write different things about what you want to manifest that week that year etc Okay. Do you not know this? I don't. I didn't. I knew he was working with Caroline Stanbury, but I didn't know it was on yeah, like spiritual it was, manifestation. Bust, it was bust the label, yeah. So that's what they're doing together. That's so weird. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, hope, hopefully they're going to Dubai sometime later this year. I probably will be going again as well, as it was so amazing. What are you amazing. doing in Dubai? Well, I'm potentially looking at moving there, looking at jobs, speaking to recruiters and things like that. So yeah. Um, you can't move to Dubai. You can come and visit. I will never go to Dubai again. Why? I, I think because there's serious... I've struggled with the human rights thing there. There's a lot of human rights violations. I mean, I went to the Burj Al Arab for my 40th birthday. Okay. And I spent, I think, $50,000 over that weekend in two days. And so I know, like, the shininess of Dubai. Yeah. But at the same token, there's a lot of bad things happening behind the scenes. And so that makes me feel uncomfortable. And there is a sense when you're there that, like, you're not totally free. 
I disagreed with that. I didn't feel that way personally. I thought, you know, it is just thinking about being respectful, like not getting with someone on the street type of thing. But I found I was able to live my life normally as I would in London from my personal perspective perspective yeah i think what i like about it is the weather's nice all the time in the summer it's it 40 degrees but you're walking air conditioning to air conditioning and things like property is cheaper you're not taxed on your salary and realistically i'd actually be able to afford to get on the property ladder in in dubai unlike here in london so yeah, that's true you know there are lots of pot pros and obviously dana mentioned some cons so it is still like weighing those things up yeah. Um, to see what outweighs what. Yeah. But, you know, I think I'm going to be going back, you know, numerous times to, to see rather than just base it on going a couple of times. So Smart. that's that's what we're doing, really. I love it. Well, listen, I'm, I'm, I have many friends in Dubai. They loved it. They did the expat thing for a few years. Yeah. And usually you get a little burnt out. But you, I think, initially will like it. I think... It's a great thing to do for like your first few years before you get married and you're starting the whole settling down thing. So you can say hi to Lindsay Lohan for me. Oh yeah, I will say hi to <laughs> Lindsay Lohan if she maybe she could be my neighbor. Who knows? We only carry sizes one, three, and five. So better off trying Sears. What about Caroline? Are you going to see Caroline there? You should try to get Caroline. I'll try. Her. I'll try. And I'll try. I mean, I speak to a couple of those Dubai yeah. housewives. So you know, I'll definitely see one of them. I mean, I went to Caroline. Brooks's spa actually yeah really it was actually really nice Is and it? like a lot of these housewife businesses a lot of them are fake or they're not open but hers was busy it was open you know yeah. it was you know stuff was happening there it's actually um by the Burj Khalifa so it's in business bay so it's a really good area to be in um Caroline Brooks's business and it's doing well well, I'll tell you what, the Burj Al Arab was the best hotel experience I ever had in my whole life. I'm not lying. I had a suite with a gold bathtub. It had Hermes yeah. bath product. It had a two, it was two stories. I overlooked the water. Yeah. They did a, um, they did like 11 birthday cakes for my birthday. Yeah, I mean, it is very lush, but I think now the place where it's all at now is the Atlantis Royal, that's the newest hotel. And that's where Beyonce did the whole opening. And they've got that Kendall Jenner's 818 tequila like thing there. Pop I went culture. there, I went there for dinner. It is, it was amazing. It was like pretty over, it was pretty overwhelming, but I found it wasn't as like blingy and goldy and things. I think it was, there was a much more European influence there, yeah. which I really liked. Yeah. So um, amazing hotel, but, uh, only one can dream to stay there because I'm not in that bracket at the moment. Does but it have butlers? It does. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you can. Yeah. There are butlers. Do you want to know a funny story? Yeah. So I, I'm at Burj Al Arab and I have my butler come in and unpacks my suitcase and notices that I have like a tear in one of my like socks or something. I swear to God. And. I look at the person and they, they, they look at me back and they're like, Madam, do you want us to sew your socks? And I was like, no way. And they did. They sewed my sock without me. Like, I was like, no, you don't have to. And they sewed it anyway. Oh my so gosh. the butler sewed my socks. I'll never forget it. Okay. And then they would make my bath. They would say like, what kind of bath salts do you want from Hermes? Come on now. I mean, to me, that's just too much. No, like, it's crazy. I like, I quite like running my own bath. Like, <laughs> just give me, just give me nice alcoholic drinks and champagne. <laughs> I'll be very happy. Oh but, my god, the pool at Burj Al Arab too is like Willy yeah, Wonka. Yeah, because it's at the ro rooftop, isn't it? Yeah, and it has all fake uh, grass, so everything's really like technicolor. And then they've got the helicopter pad right at the top yeah. as well. It was so fun. I'm not gonna lie, that was a really good time. I mean, that almost made me like Dubai. <laughs> I think you would like it if you went back. I think even since you went, there's a lot of change, there's a lot more influence because you've got to realise now about 87% of the population in Dubai is expat. So they yeah. are having to adapt. It is all expats that are doing those jobs because most of the Emiratis there, they're so rich, they don't need to work. So they need people from England, America, Australia, or, you know, Africa to be doing these jobs, 
whether it's a you know a medial job or it's you know working at a property firm or an insurance firm Are or you a doing bank. Property there? Uh, yeah. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Property. Which which is a really growing market. Yes, it has slowed down slightly, but. Miami and Dubai are one of the far, are the two fastest growing property markets. So it'd be really, really interesting time to be there. So I'm so proud of you. Okay, so now let's spill some tea. Here's the the build up on this. I I came in and I was like, Freddie, today I dropped a deep dive on the Middleton family, and I was like, I'm so surprised all of their financial scandals that they they have in their businesses. Like all of their businesses have had some sort of liquidation, and Kate Middleton's brother owes HMRC like over a hundred thousand pounds, and all this stuff in his his business. I think it was the marshmallow one or the dog food one. I yeah, don't know. Yeah, marshmallows. Yeah. I, I was bringing up Pippa and her husband and her husband's James Matthews and then tell what you said about the Chelsea and all that. So with James Matthews, so Dane was sort of like looking into like, where does all the money come from? Because the Matthews family, they do have a lot of money. So you probably all have, if you follow these celebrities, know that a lot of celebrities go to St. Bart's for New Year. Yeah. Um, they have for ages. I'd yeah. say about 10 years. It's been, like you've got people like Abramovich, Roman Abramovich, that go there, like Jay-Z and Beyonce yeah. go there. And they all go to this big hotel called um, Eden Rock St. Bart's. And that is owned by James Matthews' parents. <laughs> Which are like, it, when I say so rich, that, that like, that should, your like emoji mind blow. <laughs> kind of and goes. it's like, yeah, people like Chris Jenner and Corey Gamble go there, like, all your, the most wealthy of Hollywood, that is where they go for New Year. And they only accept cash. So you cannot pay with credit cards. You can only pay in cash. And in fact, they also own Eden Rock and Cannes, which is the big place that all the A-listers both crude and, uh, you know, behind the camera and in front of the camera stay when they're going to be participating in the Cannes Film Festival, all the A-listers. And in order for you to stay there, you have to pre-wire your money. So you, they require that you wire 20000 in advance during the Cannes Film Festival to reserve your room just for like two or three days. So just to give you the idea of how exclusive this is, and then they also have one, as, as Freddie mentioned, in St. Bart's. And yes, everybody goes there for Christmas. It's the big thing um it's part of the circuit but anyway this is it turns out james matthews parents parents. and i think it was actually maybe set up by the grandparents potentially but i know the parents definitely own it and run it now and interestingly another thing with james matthews that people might not know is that his brother is spencer matthews who was on made in chelsea and was a reality star. And then he has now married Vogue Williams, who was married to Brian McFadden from Westlife. And he, Brian McFadden, used to date Delta Goodrum, who was did like the talent, lot, lots of judging on the talent shows. And she dated Seal because I think they met on, didn't they? Was it Australia's Got Talent or so. some, or The Voice or yeah. something like that? Yeah. I know Seal definitely dated Delta for a bit. Yeah. Um, and I think there was another big celebrity that also dated her. I'm trying to think who it was. God, these people get around. They really do. So in a sense, Pippa Middleton almost did better than Kate Middleton did in her man. Because Pippa gets into this wealthy, totally social circuit family that has none of the royal bullshit to deal with. And Kate Middleton ends up getting... Prince William, which obviously huge clout and being the next queen consort and royal, but she has to deal with all the restrictions of being part of royalty. And think about it. Remember the stories of Princess Diana with the light bulb? Like Princess Diana wanted to have a higher wattage light bulb in her apartment so she could see her fashion better. And they basically said, no, you cannot have a higher voltaged light bulb because we would then have to change all the light bulbs on the floor because all the lights have to match when you look into the windows of the palace and it would increase the budget of the lighting in your wing and we don't want to pay for it. So like, I'd rather be Pippa 
in this scenario. Just saying. So doesn't David Matthews, James Matthews' father, have a lot of controversy around him at the moment? Because he was arrested by French police back in 2018. And this was over allegations that he allegedly raped a 16-year-old girl at the time on two occasions. And this happened between 1998 and 1999. Well, the allegations are that allegedly David Matthews attacked the 16-year-old girl who is said to be British, but obviously it can't be named at this moment in time. And the first time it happened was in Paris. And then the second time it happened at his hotel in St. Bart's, Eden Rock Hotel. For the full scoop, join the Dishing Drama Dana Patreon. The link is in this audio description. It's only $6 a month and you'll get the best information and tea about the things you care about. And even the things you don't know you care about. What are you waiting for?